So um, as part of this No Wrong Door effort, uh, we were uh, seeking organizations that consume information in disaster support, disaster decision-making beyond the federal family, and we stumbled upon a group called the All Hazards Consortium. Uh, it turned out I had been consuming some of their products uh, all hurricane season. Um, they're the ones that put out the fleet reports that uh -huh. allow you to understand when there's, there's movement of electric trucks into, into various areas. So um, it's very impressive what they're able to accomplish. Um, and the Tom Moran, who is the executive director of this nonprofit organization, um, in, in addition to the normal products, has been working with uh, through some funding at CHS to develop a product called Size S I S E, which um, we've invited him to talk to you about today because it does some pretty exciting things in terms of um, bringing to the table private entities to deposit information in a secure environment. Uh, there are various incentives in, built into the system that make it worth their while to offer some of their uh, data um, in order to consume some of what other people can put in. So it's, it's a really nice little ecology. It took them 12 years, Tom tells me, to build, the, um, build all of the, the agreements and trust and governance that it takes to create this decision support system. Um, so Tom is on the phone, I believe. Tom, did you make it? Yes, Jack, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> and he's brought, he's brought a team of people from the consortium, and I'll allow him to introduce them and uh, let him convey what he thinks the key takeaways are for, for all of us, <coughs> what it means to build such a thing, and what we might dream about going forward. So Tom, uh, who's joining us from vacation, Thank you for, thanks for signing on and take it away. We have your initial slide up. Wonderful. Th thank you, Jack, and uh, thank you all. Um, I'm, I'm uh, excited to be coming to you from uh, Elkins, West Virginia. Beautiful, beautiful snowy town today. So. Um, anyway, Jack, thanks for inviting us in. On the phone with me, I have the chairs of both of our work groups that have been working on this and one of our board members, I believe Tom O'Reilly. Uh, Tom, are you on? Yes, I am, Tom. Okay, wonderful. Um, so what I thought I would do is just have Kent Kildow and Mike Sapone and Tom O'Reilly just introduce themselves. I'll walk through the slides quickly, but the real secret sauce here is the people that trust one another to make this work. So once I get through the kind of the technical piece, I'm going to invite our speakers to give you their perspective from the private sector, which is really the, the name of the game here in the private sector. So, uh, Kent, Mike, Tom, why don't, I, Kent, why don't I start with you? Just introduce yourselves and, and your background a little bit. Thank you. Uh, sure. My name is Kent Kildow. I'm the Director of Business Continuity and Emergency Management at Verizon. Uh, and so my uh, full-time role is to figure out how we are going to uh, respond to uh, major emergencies, making sure that we have the right contingency plans in place, and that when something happens that we are able to uh, restore our services as quickly as possible, especially important for the first responder community. Uh, in addition to that, we do spend a fair bit of time working with uh, our critical partners across uh, not just the telecom industry, but other <coughs> industries as well, uh, to make sure that we've got the right uh, relationships in place uh, to help respond to an emergency. That's how I came across uh, the All Hazards Consortium and started working with Tom a couple of years ago uh, to expand our ability to work across uh, sector boundaries during emergencies. Tom? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. Uh, Mike Zappone? Hey, good. Uh, hello, everyone. It's, it's Mike Zappone. I'm with Eversource Energy. Uh, we're a Northeast uh, New England-based company in Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire uh, serving customers, the majority of the customers in those areas. Um, uh, like Kent, I am in the emergency preparedness business, uh, so that is my primary role. Um, as well as mutual assistance being the uh, co-chair currently of, uh, of EEI's uh, Mutual Assistance Executive Committee and also chair of the uh, Multi-State Fleet Response Working Group, um, 
which was mentioned uh, earlier. And like Kent, uh, a few years ago, um, I was uh, speaking with some of the executives here, and and there was a uh, an idea of how do we get uh, private and public sector um, uh, entities to work together. I always compare the two entities as these two giant and very powerful machines. And when they work together, there's there's very little, I believe, that can be overcome. But when they don't work in conjunction with one another, it can be a real um, a real stumbling block and a real hurdle or challenge. So, uh, again, a, a few years ago, I attended my first uh, All Hazards Consortium meeting, met Tom, uh, began to discover uh, what the group was all about, what the capabilities were, and where it was going. And it was uh, as good a fit as I've found uh, existing to uh, to accomplish just that. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm just as excited to be here as well. Uh, it's really nice to meet you all and get a chance to speak. Great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Tom? Good morning. This is Tom O'Reilly. I'm with the Center on Policing and Rutgers uh, University. The center uh, basically takes best practices and researches, research to the field uh, to be implemented by practitioners. Uh, information sharing is one of the uh, big uh, areas that we focus on both uh, within the state of New Jersey and also a number of regional uh, efforts uh, in conjunction with some of the fusion centers, particularly on the northeast along the I-95 corridor. Prior to uh, my Rutgers time, I was the uh, good time with the Department of Justice, where I was the first director of the Nationwide Suspicious Activity Reporting Program, and then uh, I did 30-some years with the state of New Jersey, last 20 as the administrator of the uh, Department of Law and Public Safety, which is a department of about 10,000 employees, which includes state police, homeland security, criminal, civil, and, uh, and some of the correctional uh, opportunities. I had the fortune of being uh, serving as the vice chair of Global, which is the Department of Justice, back on uh, information sharing. And that's where I first met Tom many, many years ago. And uh, a lot of the uh, opportunities that uh, the information sharing that the All Hazards Consortium has engaged on had, uh, had been very useful to us, particularly our experience during Sandy uh, and uh, some of the mobilization efforts there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tom. Uh, as you all can hear, these three individuals um, are a great sample of the hundreds of individuals that kind of found each other. The consortium just became a safe place for them to meet. The consortium is a uh, started in 2005. It was started by states to work together, and then in 2010 they decided to stop focusing, or not stop, but start focusing on sectors. So they had a big meeting. There's 16, 18 sectors. What do we all pick? Uh, we had six or eight of the sectors there. We had our board. We had a number of states. They all agreed, let's start with power. Let's start with the electric power restoration. If we get the power on, everybody's happy. So. Uh, I came out of telecom. I retired in 2003 from from uh, Verizon at the time, and um, was drafted into this consortium idea by the states of Maryland, D.C., Virginia, and um, it just struck a chord with me that um, this is big stuff. It's a big problem, and uh, getting power on quicker is important. But getting water restored, getting critical infrastructure, food on the shelves, cell service, all that stuff is really hard work. And what we found was there was just a number of issues they had to wrestle with. So let me go to slide three, Jack. Uh, the SICE is a subcommittee of the Fleet Response Working Group, which was formed through DHS and PPD um, just before Sandy. We started some meetings, and then Sandy hit and really gelled the effort. So the Fleet Response Working Group formed by the private sector under the consortium, separately chartered and governed, and it runs its own show, but it works with states through a very innovative um, integrated planning and governance system, which basically allows states and companies to come together. The states have their work groups, the private sector have their work groups, yet they come together in the middle and work on really, really important collaborative stuff where there just needs to be trust established. So if you look at slide three, what really created the SICE, the sensitive information sharing environment, was decision makers are flooded with data. What 
is operational and what isn't, what's reliable and what isn't. There's a myriad of reliable sources from government. There's a bunch that aren't. There's a bunch in the private sector that are reliable. There's some that aren't. And more importantly, there's sensitive information that never gets shared because of fear of blowback, leaks, media, non-operational uses. Uh, I'll give you a quick story. In 2016, the electric sector shared information with the consortium who shared it with specific folks at the state in a big response to this ice storm in Texas and Oklahoma. Well, crews from all over the East Coast were moving to Oklahoma and Texas to help put out the fires there with, you know, the electrical restoration. And some of that information got leaked out. And some states got really pissed that utility trucks were leaving their state headed to Texas when there was a big giant storm coming up the coast. And who's going to backfill my crews if my crews are going to Texas? And, um, There was very serious discussion about ending mutual assistance in that state, which would have dramatically impacted the citizens because people in power didn't understand the mutual assistance network that crews leaving one state are backfilled with another. So that leak said, you know what, we got to find a way to lock this information down. We got to create a trust framework. And we started building on some of the investments we've been made over the years. So slide four was the trick. How do we build trust? There is a lack of trust on both sides, actually. Um, And how do we sustain? Um, Government-funded portals um, are used by some in private sector, but why aren't they used by all private sector? It's usually trust. Um, It's hard to sustain on grant funds and programmatic funds. You have elections. You have turnover. You have people that shift priorities. You know, we're going to focus on A this time. We're going to drop B and C and D. Uh, The private sector can't build operational processes on things that can be turned off by government. Just not really a good idea. Um, There there was exposure to risk. You know, there was just a lot of turnover. So trust was a barrier. And trust starts with people. It doesn't start with technology. So leveraging the FEMA Catastrophic Planning Grant Program, which was put out in 28 through 2014, 2008 through 2014, the consortium and estates started putting together policies on which they could build a trust framework. So if you go to slide five, we started the SICE effort specifically from a science and technology grant uh, through the consortium and one of our partners, TSCP. And the whole idea was to build a working group and uh, out of that grant, if you will, came a working agreement. The private sector put up the attorney fees to write that agreement, which was signed by multiple states and companies. Uh, it wasn't the fir- it was just the first agreement. It wasn't the be all end all. It was just a start. They created an initial trust framework design through our partners at TSCP, the Trans Global Secure Collaboration Program, who basically runs the trust framework for the DoD and Lockheed and Boeing and all those guys. We figured let's find the best people that do this. They use a PIVI card globally. They have over half a million people that log in and share information on different parts of the projects they work on, which is millions and millions of them. And then we created a portal, it's a SharePoint portal that uses PIVI credentials to get in. The problem with that was PIVI credentials were expensive. You had to go to pl- some place, get fingerprinted, get, you know, it's kind of like a PIV card or a CAT card. That's why it's a serious freaking credential. It takes effort and cost to get it. Well, when you have to scale up during emergencies, this is not a card you can get into the hands of state people quickly. And for this to work, we needed both private sector and state operations people to have access very fast. So the PIVI card pilot funded by s and was great, but it came out of that. We came out of that with some things we needed to change. We need to simplify access. We needed to protect the information in a honeycomb kind of environment where no one individual had access to all the cells of the honeycomb or all the data sets, if you will. Um, and we need to organize the data by use case so that we were gathering data to share data on a specific problem in a specific sector. And over time, the electric sector would develop 10, 15, 20 use cases, and each one of those would have a solution set, a level of security, and people, they'd lock it down, fix it, and move on. And some of these problems were short, mid, long-term fixes. Some of them we could fix right away. Some of them took a little longer. But the SICE was basically started in 2015. So now let me show you about SICE today on slide uh, 7, I believe. Slide 6. The SICE today, the working group is still in place. Uh, it is uh, supported publicly and privately. The confidentiality and agreement is still in place. The SICE framework was downsized a little bit because the, the original was very complicated. The trust agreement was 27 or 37 pages. We got it down to four. The trust framework was uh, very sophisticated. We got it down to a little less sophisticated. Um, instead of having a portal, 
they decided to go to an app store model. Why? Everybody's familiar with the app store. You get an account, you log in, a lot of it's free, some of it's fee, and you can scale your own internal products, but you can leverage other products. And as we started working in the science and technology arena, what we found was a common thread. Lots of money, lots of great product. How do you sustain if government funding drops? That was the, that was the question. So what we did was create an app store environment where we can take a great science project and put it out there and test it. Is there a sustainment model? Will the private sector pay for this or a version of this? Is it useful? And can we align it to a use case? And by aligning it to use cases, it was relevant to the private sector. And we learned a lot by listening to the operations people, um, not, not the leadership, not necessarily the policy people, but the operations people, the folks in the field were really the ones that said, man, that is really good, or man, that is really not functional. But if you did this, this, and that, that would be awesome. And the last thing we did was we added a simple credential called a credit card. We use a $1.99 charge against everyone's credit card who's vetted as part of our vetting process. And we created a three-stage vetting process online. So individuals come to join. Um, there's a SICE agreement they have to sign. They submit a valid email and cell phone, which we use for two-factor authentication. They charge $1.99 against their credit card, which validates a lot of information about the individual. That also protects us from bots and automated attacks from the internet. And this validation process allows us to link people to a um, specific general, if you will, open app store. And then we can confine others down to specific apps that are, you know, for operational use only or special people that sign a higher level agreement. So slide seven looks at who we're supporting and advising. This has been over the last, I think over the last um, really four years, there's been so many different groups, federal, state, local, and private that have been advising us, participating, testing. Um, the next slide looks at our long-term strategy is to use this framework to connect private sector to state EOCs, which is the big connection that has to happen. A lot of times the, the state EOCs are involved in all things. They work really close with the governor, but you have to have the EOCs involved because many times when we have disasters, we have three or four states that declare an emergency where the EOC takes the lead for all state agencies. But we have 25 states where fleets are moving through where the sun is shining. So now you have to basically connect with two other agencies, not just the EOCs. You got to connect with the police. You got to connect with DOT. And this varies every storm. It's really complicated. But the idea is to connect this framework and extend it to states, to federal agencies. We're working closely with NPPD and the NIC. We're working closely with the DOE. And we're working closely with the FEMA private sector office to basically get everybody on the same page, not for everything, but for specific issues. This is all use case driven. So as we go forward, we're going to use technology like artificial intelligence to do, help us do data analytics and modeling. We wanted to use it really for operational coordination when it hits the fan. But during the blue sky days, that's when we can do exercises. We can actually create product from that. We record these disasters so we can go back and review them. And the whole, the whole, the whole point here is that each sector has issues. We help them define the first one. We call that a use case. And then we work we do mining, we come up with creative ideas to solve that use case, and that becomes an app in the App Store. So ideally, we'll have a library of communication sector apps. We'll have a library of food supply chain apps. Over time, that's the idea. So if you look at the next slide, nine, some of the products Jack wanted us to talk about is, you'll see this slide basically is our model. Users come in, they're vetted, and they get access to the App Store. There'll be an individual model App Store, and there'll be an enterprise or corporate model App Store. We're still working out kind of how we sustain that, but it'll be a subscription model of some kind. The big idea is to keep it low cost, get people vetted, uh, screen out people that are non-operational. You know, we don't accept Hotmail, we don't accept Yahoo Mail, that kind of stuff. But there's other ways we're, we're using to screen that down. And we use two-factor authentication. We will be using it on the, on the next version here coming up in about uh, two weeks. And then giving you access to some of the products. So slide 10 looks at probably our biggest use product is a product developed by NOAA is a $5 million investment uh, named GeoCollaborate. Uh, it's developed with a, a company called Storm Center out of Baltimore. Why did we pick GeoCollaborate? There's a million dashboards and viewers. That wasn't the problem. We had access to Esri. We had access to WebEOC, eTeams, Knowledge Center. And in the private sector, I could mention about 30 company companies you may have never heard of that provide all kinds of dashboards. We chose GeoCollaborate because of the requirement is Mike's opponents with Eversource Energy. He is not going to share 
his truck locations at all, if ever, unless there is a really safe environment to do so. And what we needed was an ability to have a technology that would allow Mike to buy an inexpensive license and post information when he wants to into his session and publish it to the regional session where vetted users could look at the truck locations for an hour, a day, three days, and then turn it off. And we found nothing out there until we came across this NOAA tool who was referred to us from Maryland Department of uh, Emergency Management. So this was collaborative information sharing. We hadn't seen that before. And the other reason we selected this was because it shares data from any source, doesn't replace anything, any format. We get data in Excel spreadsheets. We get them in Word documents. We get them in pictures. We get them in text. We get them in every format. We can put them all into this one platform, which integrates with everything on the market out there. So it's, it's very simple. And we can share that for operational use. And the reason we need it is because we have to get... Every time there's a disaster, we have to answer the question, how do we get 30 states, 100 plus companies, federal agencies, all on the same page at the same instant? Not on all things, just on the electric sector data that we have for fleet movement across state lines. So we've used this technology pretty much in every major storm since January 2016. Um, we found it. We tested it, it worked, we burped the baby, and over time it became the central tool we use for situational awareness when these big storms hit. Slide 12, or 11 rather, looks at the products and where we want to take this product through development is we want to create multiple dashboards. Some will be use case based dashboards by sector, some will be use case by company, some will be use case by state. So tabs across the top of the screen will allow us to, when uh, Maryland Emergency Management lights up or when DHS, the NIC, lights up, that tab will appear. When, as long as they're sharing, when they stop sharing, the tab disappears. And it allows us to bring data together from around the country and an instant based on who is involved and what use case we're looking at. So now let me jump into the next slide, which is slide 12, which is some of the products. Um, Mike Sapone has had a big hand in this one. This is the U.S.-Canadian border crossing product. It's an app, basically, that is an operational guide. What was the problem? Two to eight-hour delays per truck at the Canadian border trying to come across into U.S. to support Sandy. Major problem. This guide, after a lot of relationship development, was put together. It's now been updated for the third time. And it reduced, initially, the first version reduced delays at the border from two hours on average per truck to 20 seconds. This is a massive impact on fleet movement number one it saves lives it restores power but it got everybody on the same page so we call those operational guides we have a number of those guides in development right now it's just better process re-engineering all the data is there nobody brought it all together into one place and that's what the fleet working group does it aggregates and consolidates information on specific use case so that crossing the canadian border was a big use case the next slide, 13, looks at one we put together during uh, Matthew. How do, we, how do we centralize state declarations in one place? States declare declarations, nobody knows. They don't post them on websites sometimes. They're delayed. The press release comes out at noon. The declaration doesn't show up till 1.30. That's a problem when you've got fleets moving from Ohio to South Carolina for Matthew. So we worked it out, we put together a little website, we started organizing it, and boom, it became one place, and we have thousands and thousands of trucks and, and operations people, and Mike, Mike is one of the users of this, where we centralize all the documentation in one place for our, for our users, and we store the history of that over time. It's called Storm Central. It's a website, okay? And we do the work, we aggregate the data, and the people get access to the data. The next slide, 14, looks at another product that was developed for EasyPass, another Sandy product. We had huge toll station delays during Sandy. The electric sector called us. We got on the phone with the toll director at New Jersey. In 10 minutes, we worked out a project or a process. The process basically was, look, use the far right lane where there's a person, give them a business card or letterhead, count the trucks and move on. That was the short-term fix, and we eliminated delays. But we needed something a little longer term. So we started a series of interviews with a number of states that belong to the EasyPass network, and we found that, hey, if you open your account in Delaware, okay, it's, uh, they have a process there that all the other states accept, and it's, it's, uh, it allows you to operate all your vehicles under a single transponder as long as you up load your spreadsheet of trucks into their database. They will manage your trucks. You can use the fast lane. They take a, tick, a picture of the front and back of the truck. They track it back to the account. 
in Delaware and boom they pay your credit card it simplifies and automates it and what it does it allows trucks in Kentucky that don't work in the Easy Pass region when they come into North Carolina which is in the Easy Pass region they don't have to stop and swap transponders and buy transponders or carry money they don't want to carry money these 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 trucks can get robbed and there's a lot of money to move as you go through tolls so the Easy Pass solution another operational guide has really done wonders to eliminate delays at toll stations let me uh, a couple more and then we'll uh, no I think that's it um, so what I wanted to just I wanted you to hear directly from the private sector here because we have a number of products probably about 18 or 19 are our own but in the App Store we have about 70 that are developed by others and we're starting to aggregate some of those and more importantly we are we are putting together a standard where we're working. We had a call today with the QSEC consortium, the earthquake consortium down in New Madrid, uh, in, in, uh, in Kentucky. And we're working to build a, con a federated standard on ORL, operational readiness level. So we want to be able to tell the private sector, hey, that product, that app, that website, that is an ORL one, which means it's operationally ready for use. It might be a two, which means it's good, it's not perfect, which means you can still use it at your own risk. Three is a little less safe. Four is four is kind of the lower one. Doesn't mean it's bad. You can still use it, but we also want to tell the people that own the product, hey, if you'd like to move it up, here's some recommendations how you can improve your research to make it more valuable, how you can upgrade your data sets to make it more reliable. ORL is really designed for the operational decision makers to say, okay, that one is good and that one is move at your own risk. So lots of technology, but is it ready for operation? So the site's working group is developing that standard behind the curtain. Um, so let me uh, let me just invite Kent and uh, Mike and, and Tom just to provide some kind of real world perspective on some of this. So Kent, I'll start with you maybe from your perspective, uh, if you share some of your thoughts. Tom, you know, as I think about uh, response to major emergencies, we find that most of our uh, BAU processes will address the majority of the roadblocks we come into, uh, and we do that by matching specific data sets to the issue we're working on, and then coming up with a way to, you know, make the recovery as efficient as possible. Uh, obviously, we do not have every data set. Uh, nor do we have the resources in place to go out and do a lot of research uh, during a response to, a, to an incident. And, um, you know, this work is really filling a gap there where it gives us access to information that will help us uh, optimize the recovery that we are working on by giving us uh, data from other sectors and from the state agencies in a consolidated place so that we can quickly access it, uh, see how we can or how it applies to uh, the business issues that we're working on, and then make uh, sound decisions to focus our recovery. Uh, things like where do we focus on sustaining our, uh, our backup power systems, because we know it's going to take our uh, commercial power partners a little longer to recover things. Uh, where we have state declarations for uh, emergency and uh, travel restrictions that might be in place, uh, being able to get that all in one spot really does help us respond as uh, efficiently as possible. Uh, we have taken advantage of the Easy Pass uh, process that Tom described to help with our movement of resources between states uh, during the response to some of the more recent. Uh, major hurricanes and uh, nor'easterns that we've uh, had to deal with. Uh, and we also use uh, some of the other data that's, uh, that's available on a regular basis. But I think the thing that's even more exciting about the work that Tom just described is the processes that are being put in place to be able to add to uh, the resources that are available through uh, the All Hazards Consortium and the SICE. Um, it's going to uh, not only expand on uh, the capabilities of the tools that are there, but are really putting the processes in place to uh, increase the rate at which those uh, resources are being added to the site. So, um, you know, from my perspective, it's not only a uh, great tool today, uh, but the future is looking even brighter in uh, the rate at which that uh, that tool is going to improve is, is really quite impressive. So um, just a couple of thoughts, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Tom. 
Uh, thank you, Kent. Uh, Mike Sapone. Uh, yeah, a great job, by the way. Uh, and he, he really did nail a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of the promise and and the per, and, and the current performance of the tools. Um, I was I've recently been been shopping for a new car, and um, uh, in one particular uh, model that I drove, the instrumentation was now in the windshield. And what that allowed me to do was to take a look at how my car was performing and how I was doing, while at the same time not really taking my eyes off the road. Uh, this size environment is, is very much the same thing. We call them dashboards, but really we're turning this into a cockpit um, to be able to make decisions on. We spend much too much time uh, answering emails, waiting for callbacks, waiting for a conference call, conflicting conference calls. Do we have enough people to cover those conference calls? Are they getting back to us with accurate information, or is it kind of second and third hand? Um, this, this environment now allows the, the emergency manager um, to, to sit in, in his or her chair uh, with, with the SICE environment and the tools in front of them, as well as their own monitoring uh, uh, systems that they have for their own, in my case, my own service territory, covering three states. How are we doing as a company? But what is available out there uh, to leverage to make it even better? Um, uh, and and that's, that's from a requesting kind of standpoint, from a responding standpoint. Imagine uh, if I'm coming to help you and you're able to give me all of the latest information or I'm able to obtain it so that I can find the fastest route possible for you, uh, for myself to get my people boots on the ground faster. Uh, these, th th this environment, this sharing environment, this collaboration is what's cutting out all of those other hurdles and challenges to what, to leveraging each learning about understanding and then leveraging each other's capabilities. Um, the, you know, again, completely excited about uh, being able to bring this forward and, um, you know, uh, eventually uh, I see this as being leveraged not only by the public, public sectors, uh, but also the private uh, as well in a trusted environment. Uh, for what? For, for the good of the people that we serve, both public and privately, uh, in, in, in our communities and those across the, across the country. So, um, you know, with that, Tom, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Tom? Uh, Tom, Tom the, uh, I, think, I, I think that uh, you covered most of the points. Let me just make a couple of uh, points that I want to emphasize. One is that the, the beauty of this is that it's unlocking existing data not creating new solutions or new uh, 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 searches or, or uh, systems, but basically unlocking the data that we collect every day. It's going in an entrusted environment that's keeping it simple or lightweight. Uh, it's wrapped around the business use case, so it's relevant to the pr practitioners in terms of uh, basically it's a problem in search of a solution versus so many times we're confronted with technology solutions that then go searching for a problem to uh, solve. And most importantly, perhaps, it's real time in terms of uh, having a major uh, impact on both public safety, public health, uh, and, and commerce. And I think just as one, one point, uh, just to de demonstrate the utility of this in the most simplest form, during Sandy, we had difficulty in New Jersey with the issues of uh, gas stations and uh, critical food supplies, particularly milk and baby formula and things of that nature, was by pulling together the, the think tank process that was developed by the All Hazards Consortium that they were able to identify that uh, most any store that was open would generally be using credit cards and uh, the one satellite company, use satellite, would have the majority of those transactions. So by working with that company, you're able to, within a couple of minutes, uh, all hydrogen consortium, I should say. Within a couple of minutes, we were able to identify those gas stations that were open and pumping gas and those 
convenience or food stores that had been open and selling uh, supplies and food uh, stuff that were necessary for part of the recovery. So I think that, that kind of, to me, demonstrated its net, uh, net value. And obviously, we've seen many times, unfortunately, in the last couple of months, last couple of years, how the electric mobilization issue in terms of fleet uh, movement has also been uh, very, very uh, critical. So I think there's a lot of good business use cases that are being addressed by uh, what's being developed here, and there's more to uh, more to come in the future. Great. Thank you, Tom. Jack, that's uh, that's it. We can. Uh, I know we've run long here. I just open it up for any questions or comments from from your folks. No, I think everyone's really uh, digesting it. I found out we've got a few people in the room who heard you speak previously at a CAC meeting, so um, we're, we're in touch with the progress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, this is uh, this is great to hear, and, and we appreciate, it, especially having that private sector perspective. So, thank you all very much for uh, for joining us. Keep up the good work. Very good. So thing. we have to ask you to we we'll have to ask uh, your team to sign off and hang up. Um, for the remainder of our meeting because of the Sure. Good. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you for coming and helping out. Very good. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care. All right. Thank Thanks you. again. Okay.